Well, welcome everybody, and thank you so much for your diligence. Um, it means a lot to see your commitment in getting into our Zoom webinar today. Apologies for those technical issues. Um, this is uh, the ICS webinar, the initial economic impact of COVID-19 on South Carolina's childcare sector. Uh, my name is Megan Carolyn. I'm the Director of Policy Research at the Institute for Child Success um, and the primary author of a survey report that we put out last month um, trying to gauge what the coronavirus and the economic closures um, have really meant for child care providers in the state of South Carolina. Um, we will aim to still keep us on time today um, with the, two, uh, the 3 o'clock end time, and we'll have a recording of this available um, to send around as well. Um, if you have any other technical issues, fingers crossed that you won't, um, you can just send them on over to my, my colleague, uh, Lisa, who is on the Institute for Child Success account on the chat window. Great, so we will go ahead and get started. Um, we're just gonna do a real quick review before we get started of what the child care landscape was looking like in South Carolina um, before the pandemic and before the economic crisis that's resulted. We'll talk a little bit about the survey findings, um, which were very eye-opening to us, and then we'll talk a little bit about what happens next, what do we do with these findings, and what are we learning about reopening in the state as well as from other states. Um, I think many of you are aware of many of these landscape issues, so I will refrain from pe preaching to the choir today. Um, frankly, it's a fragile sector. Um, you know, we at ICS are focused on the range of issues impacting children from prenatal to age eight as part of our mission. And so child care falls pretty squarely in that domain. Um, infant toddler care, we certainly know, is more expensive than um, three and four-year-old care. And we also know, you know, we're based in Greenville, South Carolina, but we focus across the state and nationwide. Um, we also know that the, the situation can look very different in different parts of the state. Um, where we're based in Greenville, certainly, we, we know that we are a child care desert. Um, that's defined as having three or more children in the county for every available child care slot. Uh, and as you can see from these access figures, that frankly, there's always been more children in the state potentially needing child care than are able to get it through um, licensed slots with DSS. Um, so it's looking across all settings, group child care homes, family child care homes, um, child care centers. Um, so it's always been a rough situation for families in terms of accessing that care. On the other hand, it has always been a very difficult balancing act for child care providers to make ends meet with operating a business. Uh, child care providers get into the business because they love children and they want to provide an essential service in their community. But there's very unclear professional pathways. Um, it's very different than being in a K-12 school system. Um, compensation is low and providers generally try to keep their care as affordable as they can for families, but that often means there isn't a lot of wiggle room in the budget. Um, there's also high turnover um, as a result of the low pay and often lack of benefits. It's also draining work physically and sometimes emotionally draining working with, with children all day. Um, I think as any parent who is currently home quarantined with their children can now testify, it's very draining work and we should pay them a lot more money than we do. Um, but the workforce issues are you know, significant um, in the field and they, they play a real role in the survey findings that we heard. Um, it's also a pretty large sector of the economy in South Carolina. There's 6,700 um, providers employed in South Carolina in the child care field. That doesn't include public school um, 4K teachers. Um, those providers live and work in those communities. Their dollars stay local. Um, and so when we're seeing impacts on child care services through their employment, we're going to see a contraction of the local economy as a result of that. And as we said, um, the situation is difficult for families as it is. Um, this is coming from uh, Child Care Aware's 2019 state fact sheets, the average annual cost for child care. As you can see, um, infant care is more expensive no matter what setting you're in. Um, a family child care home, which is usually smaller, or center-based care, um, just the virtue of you need a smaller group size for infants, so you need to employ more providers if you have a larger class size, um, and the ratio of math that goes along with that. For context, though, on these figures, um, center-based care for an infant, for example, so that's that 6840 number over here, um, that's 13% of the median household income in South Carolina. Um, if you are a single earner, it's 25% of the median income. Um, 
And it's not because child care providers are making money hand over fist, it's because the economics of this field are a difficult balancing act and it's stressful for providers and it's stressful for parents. This is sort of where the rubber met the road for everybody in mid-March um, with the quick spread of the coronavirus and a lot of uncertainty as it was spreading, uh, how children could be impacted, could they be carriers? Some of these questions we still don't have great answers to. Um, so in South Carolina, it was a, a voluntary closure order in terms of local conditions and providers making those decisions based on the realities in their communities. It was not a statewide closure. Um, a lot of different states went in different directions with this, but as you can see from this quick snapshot of headlines, it was not a good story anywhere. Um, nationally, half of centers reported to NACI that they couldn't survive a closure of two weeks financially, and that's because many of the costs are fixed costs. It's things like rent and paying your providers. It's not disposable costs that would change with, with scaling down. For those who did stay open, 85% of them are operating at 50% or less of their capacity. And we'll talk a little bit about that in South Carolina. Um, about one third in North Carolina reported they would close permanently without immediate financial relief. We're hearing that one third number a lot. In Nebraska, many reported that they're unable to make their next rent or mortgage payment for either their home or their business. Um, and in Louisiana, 72% reported they had stopped collecting tuition. This might seem self-evident, right? You're not serving kids right now, so why would you be collecting tuition? That then puts providers in a situation of being unable to afford those fixed costs to still have their building and their staff when they reopen. Um, providers did that because of an understanding that their families could no longer pay, but it really put them in a difficult place with cash flow. So this is what we knew in early April when ICS got pulled into several conversations about what is the situation in South Carolina and what can we learn from other states. So we took a look through the existing literature and decided the best way to answer these questions would be fielding our own study. Um, we created a pretty quick 10-minute survey and got it out as extensively as we could through child care networks. Uh, we wanted folks to answer it no matter what type of setting they were. We wanted a lot of diversity in the county. So as we dive into the survey findings, just a quick snapshot of who's represented here. Um, this was a 10-day survey window in mid-April. The first thing I'll say is that in coronavirus time, mid-April was a decade ago. Um, the situation has changed since then, and we know that, and I'm going to speak a little bit at the end about how we're reacting to uh, moving from mostly closure to moving into reopening. We had 98 respondents across 22 counties. That's about half of the state's counties represented. As you can see, um, you know, some were more represented than others. Um, of almost half or over half of these respondents indicated that they used, uh, accepted the, the state child care vouchers. In particular, we want to draw attention to the child care voucher situation. Um, we know that for families who are receiving those vouchers, um, you know, there is income eligibility. So these are lower income families to begin with. Uh, who meet several income criteria um, and are likely to be disproportionately impacted by other parts of this crisis as well. And so because the economic hits and the job losses were um, really resonating so quickly with lower income hourly wage workers, we expect that many of the families who use these vouchers are either facing cut hours or being laid off um, and really being in a position uh, even more vulnerable economically than they were at the beginning of the crisis. Um, I'll also note that internally we ran an analysis of what we were calling rural versus non-rural counties. This is different than the definition that DSS uses um, of how they distinguish rural providers. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about that today. What we just did was considered uh, Charleston, Greenville, Lexington, Richland, Spartanburg, and York counties as non-rural. So we took those six counties out when we talk about rural counties to try to get a sense of how the impacts might be a little bit different and how the remedies they need might be different. We'll talk about that as we go. So who are our respondents? 77% um, of our respondents are coming from child care centers, um, which makes sense because 69% of the uh, registered providers in the state are child care centers. Uh, group homes, family child care homes make up a much smaller percentage of the field. Um, for the most part, not huge differences between the rural and non-rural respondents that we received. Faith-based providers are more likely to be in rural counties. Head Start providers were only in the non-rural counties. But I think it's really important to think about these provider-type differences in the broader picture of things. 
So, for example, in um, Jasper County, for example, more than half of all the providers in the entire county are family child care homes. And so what we learn about the overall picture might not be the same situation as what we see in a county with a heavy family child care home presence. Um, I raise this not to say the data isn't useful, it is, but that it's also essential for um, government or philanthropic remedies to be engaging the folks that are right there on the ground. Um, family child care providers might have different needs than what a group child care provider does, and it's important to be talking to those providers to understand that. So from our survey, we asked folks to report their operating status as of April 15th. Um, you can see here that about half, 48%, were closed for all registered families, and 39% were open for all registered families. Um, this really speaks to the fact that every provider, every community is experiencing this crisis differently, certainly in April and you know, moving into June now. Um, folks were reading the needs of the local community and understanding their own financial and logistical needs. We heard that a lot of providers um, felt that they had families who needed the care because there weren't other centers nearby that the kids could go to instead. They feared that if they closed, people wouldn't have anywhere for their children to go or that um, there were a lot of essential workers, um, grocery store clerks, nurses, doctors, et cetera, um, who were needing that child care, and so they wanted to stay open for them. Um, our rate is a little bit different than what the state reports. Um, DSS was tracking uh, that about um, 50 to 51 percent of, of centers closed. What this just means is that um, our survey you know, surveyed slightly different people. The DSS numbers do report from the whole state, we think our survey was easier to respond to if you were still opening because you were checking your email and your social media to see it. Um, we also did find that providers in rural counties were more likely to be operating than those in non-rural counties. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that rural versus non-rural operating distance on the next slide. So when we asked all of our respondents, first, what is your capacity, you know, your licensed capacity, and then how many children are actually still attending on a roughly daily basis or as you would expect? And again, this is April 15th. Um, our respondents reported a little bit over 6,600 available slots. Not everybody responded, but for those who did report it. Um, of those 6,600 slots, only about 2,000 still had children coming in for those slots on a daily basis. So providers who are open are operating with one-third the number of kids they usually are, which is huge. Um, if we're assuming that all to most of those parents who aren't sending their kids anymore also aren't sending their tuition anymore, um, these are stunning impacts that centers had to absorb basically overnight. Um, we break this out here in a couple different ways. You can see by age, infant, toddler, preschool and school age, um, and then rural versus non-rural. What we found by and large is that if you look at these infants and toddler numbers, there's not huge differences between the rural and non-rural communities, but when we get to older children, there is a difference there. Um, for preschoolers, 26% in the non-rural counties were still attending, 38% in the rural counties were still attending. When you get to school-age children, it's even more stark, and this is keeping in mind that schools generally across the entire state um, shut down. And so in non-rural counties, just 12% were still attending compared to 41% in rural counties. Now, we didn't have any survey responses that could help us figure out exactly why. Nobody wrote us an open-ended response that explained that. But inferring from some of the other comments, we think that one, this is a reflection of the differences in some of these counties, um, a perceived need for that continued child care. Um, we also think that some of the, the messaging around how children are impacted by this might be playing a part as well. There's still a lot we don't know about exactly how the virus impacts children and why it doesn't seem to impact them as strongly as it does adults. Um, but by and large, people get more nervous with babies and toddlers, especially children who you know, are younger and perceived to be more vulnerable. Um, that might explain part of the decision to stop sending in younger children, um, just sort of a, a more protectiveness we have over, over babies. Um, you might also say that, you know, well, my infant puts everything in their mouth, but my school-age child doesn't, so this is likely to be a safer scenario for them to go in for. Um, 
We also know that for some of the counties that fell into the rural definition, the situation was very different than in the non-rural counties. Um, but that has changed significantly since then. Um, so for example, Warren, Horry, and Georgetown County are all reported in this rural number. Um, back in April, their per capita rate of cases was very low. And so it was reasonable for a provider to look around and say, it's not that dangerous to keep operating. What we now know is that in the last two weeks, these have become hot spots within the state for the cases being on the rise. Um, this speaks to the fact that the situation can change very quickly. Um, providers have had to be nimble and responsive, and they do not have the cash flow to be as nimble as they need to be right now. It also speaks to the fact that as we get into reopening, we're going to need some new information. Um, and so ICS is preparing to send out a follow-up survey to some of the providers who responded the first time and you know, potentially a, a new audience as well to try to understand what their situation looks like now. How are they handling opening or closure decisions now? Um, you know, in some way, South Carolina was not hit as hard in the first wave of this in April, um, but those case numbers are coming up now and providers have to navigate a new reality as other businesses are starting to reopen. So what did we hear from providers in terms of their material needs, their financial needs? Well, we asked them, and again, this is in April, how long could your center financially survive a closure? You can see here that the news is not good. Uh, one third said they did not know. They did not know their cash flow well enough to know how long they could live on what was already in the bank, um, which largely points to the fact that child care providers are the smallest of the small businesses sometimes, and they don't necessarily have access to the type of bookkeeping services and financial guidance that would help them to make these decisions and make them based on understanding what's in their reserves and how long they could survive. Um, that points to a real need in recovery and rebuilding to understand the business needs of child care centers and not just the needs of families for child care. Another about third said that they could not handle any closure at all. So essentially their fear was if they closed those doors, they would never reopen again. Um, these two groups are really important to talk about because of them, the vast majority chose to stay open. And that makes sense when you're running a business. If you think, I could close my doors today and never reopen them, you'll continue operating to try to bring in some of your revenue, even though it's much lower than usual because of capacity. Um, what we don't know is whether those providers were also able to take appropriate um, safety measures to make sure that while they were still operating, um, you know, they were distancing and otherwise creating a healthy environment for children. They were making decisions with very narrow information as we all were back in April, um, and that financial pressure was significant. I'll also draw your attention to this little slice here of 9%. That's folks who said they knew they could survive several months. This data was collected two months ago. That 9% is essentially the providers who are sure they could last until right now. And so when we talk about the number of providers who might not reopen, We've heard estimates like 50% might not reopen, one third might not reopen. And that's in line with what the national data is telling us. But what we know is that as of April, only 9% knew they could make it to, to June and be able to reopen. So we're expecting that in coming weeks, as more businesses reopen, as more families are comfortable sending their children back, we're going to be seeing a very heavy wave of centers that are permanently closed or centers that have to significantly take down their capacity in order to serve children. Um, again, much of the state, 85% of the state, actually already lives within a child care desert. That's not 87. More than half of the state lives within a child care desert, and that's where there's three children for every one slot. That case, that number is about to get significantly higher as there's going to be fewer slots available for children who need them. We asked about both uh, cost and revenue, and I'm laughing because I didn't even put the revenue slide up here because the answer was so clear. Everybody said our revenue problem is there's no revenue. Um, most providers receive their funding uh, significantly from private pay families. Um, what we found is that those who served largely private pay families were sort of the hardest hit. Um, those who received South Carolina vouchers and Head Start funding were in a more stable circumstance because those providers said, Keep taking the money, you know, take the, the federal and state money just the same as if you were offering services, but it's okay to close for safety. Um, 
but it doesn't take a, an accountant to tell you that if you don't have money coming in, that, that's going to be a problem. Um, but we asked about cost concerns. What were the fixed costs and the, and the sort of more flexible costs that they continued operating that they were most concerned about? You'll see here that more than half are worried about their rent and mortgage. Um, that makes sense. We actually know that rent and mortgage are a huge part of what makes for the cost of early childhood. If somebody said to you, have this building for free, um, which sounds wild, but does actually happen. Sometimes school districts are done with an elementary school and they can you know, sell it for a dollar to a child care provider. Um, that changes the economics completely if you don't have facility costs. Um, so we expected that rent and mortgage would be a pretty high concern. Some of our respondents said that they'd worked out a deal with their landlord for a month or maybe two months, but not more than that. And that really only worked for folks who had been in their facility for a long time. Um, keep in mind, too, some of these are family child care providers. And so when they say rent and mortgage, they mean their home because that's their workplace as well. We were very surprised, though, that other facilities costs came in at above 60%. Um, that number includes things like your HVAC system and continuing to run it so that your center is ventilated even while people aren't there. Um, and business insurance was a particular one that folks were concerned about. They're paying very high fees for their business insurance, but many told us that they would not be getting any financial relief from that business insurance, that that was meant for things like a natural disaster destroys their building. It was not meant for things like I've lost all of my business. Um, which obviously providers are very frustrated about. They're paying into this service that isn't going to help their business in the long term. Um, about half reported that they had continued to pay their staff, so we'll talk a little bit more about exactly how complicated that got. Um, and you can see that one third here had uh, already stopped paying their staff or expected they would have to. Um, emergency supplies and sort of normal operating supplies aren't a huge cost concern. The bigger issue there, though, is going to be access. We heard that very strongly in the qualitative results. Um, yes, there's the cost of buying masks and buying hand sanitizer, but the bigger issue is where do you get them from when every other business in the state and every family in the state is trying to get masks and soap and toilet paper? Um, where do you, as a medium-sized child care provider, find a source to get that material? And you can't just open with one box of face masks. You need to know that you have enough to keep your business going for the next month or so. And so we found some real concerns both with the, the financial element, but even just access and the time it takes to track down those resources. So we tried to put a little bit of a finer point on what these economic losses look like so far. And so we asked folks, um, in the current month, which was or it, it, what they had already sustained, so from March 15th to April 15th, what was your current financial impact? On average, $22,000 in additional costs and lost revenue. That was then projecting an additional $31,000 for the month that was going to be April 15th into May 15th. We only asked in that time window because we didn't know for sure if this was going to keep going into May. We had no reason to believe that the losses were any less for May into June. Um, so when we released this report in May, we were saying that the average is going to be about $50,000 in losses. It would be a lot safer at this point going into mid-June to say um, $70,000 to $80,000 on average. For many of these providers, that is insurmountable. They will not make up those losses in the next three months. They will not make up those losses ever. We wanted to get a sense of how different centers were impacted differently by this. Um, we couldn't find too many trends in terms of the rural versus urban, um, but the biggest trend was along the center size. Um, some centers are very small, family child care, for example, you're talking about a couple children, whereas some centers are, are very, very large. There are centers in the state that serve you know, up to 300 children. Um, you can see this green line is at $31,000, I'm sorry, that's a $22,000 average in there. Um, a lot of centers are very, very high above that. For these larger centers, you know, of course, you have more children, but that also means you have more people to pay. You have a bigger facility that you're paying rent or mortgage on. Um, those are huge numbers. Some of those might be affiliated uh, with a, a national entity or with a franchise, but this is what makes the coronavirus crisis so different from everything else we've experienced before. This isn't a hurricane where just the centers in South Carolina have been impacted. Even for national companies that franchise out, 
every single one of their centers has been impacted at the same time. Um, and so we're going to think first and foremost about the locally grown, the locally owned businesses, um, because that money you know, stays most local in South Carolina. But national franchise centers are also being um, very hard hit by this and might not have the reserves that we think they do to sort of um, weather through this crisis. Um, you can also see a, a sharp peak here with the 70 to 79, which is actually uh, around the average um, of capacity across centers in South Carolina. So there's a lot of centers that are going to fall right into this area here, which is above that $22,000 loss. It was very important to us to collect open-ended responses on this survey, and not just because there were things we weren't going to know about. Of course, there were, you know, I don't provide childcare on a daily basis. I'm not living that reality. Um, but also for agency, childcare providers have often been overlooked in government investment. They're overlooked when we talk about the education system. Um, they are overlooked in some of the federal financing that has been coming out to try to assist uh, businesses in rebuilding, and they felt that acutely. Many of the providers told us with their open-ended concerns that they were just grateful to have even been asked for what they were facing. Um, and I think that that's really important to, to think about. Um, providers talked about the confusion around whether they were essential or not. And that might just be a government definition, right? Can you keep operating? Can you not? Are you essential? But a lot of providers felt that much more deeply. It was a judgment on the field and felt that it has not generally been recognized that they are essential to the operations of the entire economy. The economy can't reopen unless parents feel comfortable with where their children are. So what we heard um, when we did open up to this open-ended comments, first of all, supplies, as you can see in this word cloud, was just a huge part of the equation. Um, there's concern over accessing COVID-specific supplies, uh, protective equipment, cleaning supplies, um, folks want you know, the no-touch thermometers, which was not the cost they built into their budget at the beginning of the year so that they can screen children as they come in. Um, now as we're looking into reopening, there's things like, do we need plexiglass dividers for some parts of the center? And where are we going to get that when plexiglass is sold out? Um, there's also just the things they need for regular operations, like groceries and the regular cleaning supplies for a child care center. We heard about um, wipe shortages, diaper shortages, one woman shared the experience of trying to buy um, breakfast foods for her center. She said she wanted to make it a refuge for the kids during this hard time. And somebody tried to fight her in the grocery store for buying too many strawberries. So child care providers are people and members of our community, and they're facing the same challenges that we all are at the same time as they're trying to keep their businesses afloat for kids who really need it. We also heard very strong frustration with government relief and the lack of access to it. Um, and you can see Paycheck Protection Program cut right across the middle here. Um, we had a couple providers who said they applied for that program, which is a reimbursable uh, loan from the federal government for payroll. It's meant to cover expenses for about eight weeks. Many of you may have heard the media coverage in the beginning that the money just disappeared, I mean, practically overnight. Um, there was a second wave of funding that came out, and applications are still open for that until the end of this month, actually. If there's anybody on this call who is looking into that option, we have some resources that we posted on our blog this week um, about navigating that application process. But many of them said, I contacted a bank, and they never even got back to me if they would submit our application for us. Um, you know, some were you know, rejected. Um, when NACI did a national survey on providers using the Paycheck Protection Program, they found that in particular family child care providers were very unlikely to be able to access it. Um, some of them felt that they didn't have the financial records they needed. Some of them were concerned about how it would impact their own credit. Frankly, that loan isn't supposed to impact your own credit. That was something that the Small Business Administration um, you know, tried to make clear. But this really speaks to the knowledge barrier. If you are trying to run a one or two person shop and keep providing childcare, you don't have time to navigate SBA's website and find a provider and read the fine print. So a lot of providers didn't even apply because they thought that they wouldn't be eligible or that it would negatively impact them down the line if they were to close. Um, and as a result, we've seen that businesses that are more savvy and that have you know, um, a business association or a chamber membership to help talk them through this were more able to access that funding. 
we heard a lot of concerns about staffing, and this went in a couple of different directions. Um, folks want to keep paying their staff, but just said, I'm, I'm out of money. We heard from one provider who had done a fundraiser for their uh, capital improvement campaign for the facility, and then wound up basically emptying that capital improvement fund to keep paying their staff, um, which really speaks to the fact that this might be a crisis that doesn't go on forever, but the impacts will be felt for a long time. Um, providers are concerned about their staff who have been laid off finding new jobs and not coming back when they reopen. Um, they said a lot of staff members had a hard time applying for unemployment insurance and weren't able to access that, uh, which is frustrating. They care about their staff as people. Um, and we're also concerned about staff getting sick. Some have said that they had had to close because staff members had been sick. Um, and so just a number of different concerns, financial and very human-centered. We also then heard about just uncertainty of what the future looks like. Um, having enough enrollment to keep your doors open is key to keeping your doors open. It's sort of chicken or the egg. Will we have enough people to reopen and make ends meet to pay our bills? But if we don't reopen, we won't know how many people are going to be coming in. Um, that's a real limbo that providers are navigating as we speak to try to figure out how comfortable folks are with reopening, what accommodations need to be put into place, um, and whether they'll be able to keep their business the way that they intended it. Um, and the mental toll and uncertainty that this took on providers and owners in particular, um, it's concerning. You know, burnout is high in this field, um, partly because of the lower compensation, but also, too, you don't get into childcare because you don't care about children. People are very concerned about what the children they care for are experiencing at home. Um, are they getting enough to eat? Are they having an increase in, in child abuse at home? Um, how are their families making ends meet? What do they need? And then just concern too, we had two providers who said they've been in the field over 20 years say that this is the most stressed they've ever been and that they think they'll lose their businesses. Um, those are two veteran providers who bring with them a wealth of information and compassion who frankly think they'll have to close their doors. Um, we did hear gratitude, which as I said in the beginning, I think just speaks to how overlooked this field Deals. Um, we're going to be doing some more to help share what we've heard from them and link it to what we're hearing from other providers working with children as well. Um, the early childhood sector isn't a sector. It's lots of little different sectors you know, linked together, and that can make it difficult sometimes to come together with a common voice. But certainly what we're hearing as an organization from this crisis is that um, we need a lot more investment in early childhood infrastructure to help support businesses and to help support those children. Megan? So what? Megan? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. I want to say um, that Lorraine Craig and Sullivan, she mentioned that um, she's aware of some centers opening, but have had to close as a result of staff members contracting COVID-19. Mm. We had a couple of um, providers in the survey. I think we had two providers in the survey who said that they had been intending to keep operating and that they had to close because of staff members. And again, this was back in April. Um, South Carolina's numbers are on the rise right now, and so I think that that's a reality we could be seeing in some other places. That's hard for a provider to absorb, and then they have to worry about, will families go elsewhere when they close for two weeks, or will they not trust them anymore? But also, obviously, if a provider tests positive, it's what they have to do. Um, very soberingly, we had one respondent say um, it's a mother-daughter business and the patriarch of the family died from the virus and that um, they had been operating and then they closed for two weeks to try to figure out now what? You know, someone just lost their husband, someone just lost their father. They're trying to operate their business, but they're dealing with grief. They didn't know if they could get their providers into unemployment while they were closed. They didn't really know if they could reopen. Um, that was somebody who actually said, you know, please reach out to me when you read this because we don't know what to do next. And we've been able to, to connect them with some folks to try to get the business back on track. But I think that the human level of this is really important to keep in mind too. We have all come up with business plans in our own organizations to think about what happens when X, Y, and Z closes, what happens when we can't travel, what happens when we can't go to the grocery store. But it's harder to think about what happens if your actual employees are impacted by this, you know, knock on wood. Um, but that's the reality of this virus is that it, it cross cuts, you know, gender and workplace and all types of identities. Um, and I think that 
with all states that are looking at a reopening right now, I think it's a real concern to make sure not just that the children are fine, but that the staff members are also taken care of. So what are we doing with all of this very sobering information? Well, first of all, we're doing a good bit of education like this webinar and a few others that we've been on. Um, we were very pleased to be invited by the State First Step Office to speak with their EDs and their quality improvement folks. Um, just to sort of share what we're learning about the conditions on the ground and what providers need. Um, we've been in touch with um, other state agencies as well and several other agencies outside of the state. You know, there's a whole research community looking at this question right now of what do providers need. And the specifics are going to be different state to state, but the challenges are very similar. Um, and so we've been working with folks in Rhode Island and Alabama and Nebraska to understand what they're experiencing and sort of learn from each other. Um, We've also had some folks on our team reaching out to um, elected officials, um, both at the state and federal level from South Carolina's delegation. They hear this and they get it. And I know that sometimes in politics it can feel like uh, our voices go unheard. Um, we have not necessarily seen all of the, the assistance that we would want yet at government levels. Um, but certainly when we speak to elected officials about this, they understand that the economy cannot reopen without childcare. And they're also concerned about their constituents who are the small business owners who are facing, you know, potentially shutting their doors right now. Um, so for everybody on the call who works with providers, you know, I do want you to take this away. Uh, it's not just us yelling into a void. You know, people are listening and, you know, trying to find some ways to, to help mitigate the crisis. Um, you know, in particular, I do want to draw attention to, some of you may have seen there was an article in the Post and Courier just this week um, about childcare, which is great to even see this attention getting that type of media attention. Um, you know, First Steps continued to um, pay their providers as did Head Start, which is so important to keeping the, the financial stability there. Um, DSS has also been using um, funds from the Federal CARES Act for a couple different responses. There were uh, emergency child care vouchers for essential workers, so those got run through very, very quickly. A lot of people needed them. Um, there are some, uh, some grant funds were made available for cleaning supplies, and there's also going to be some grants made to, to help um, providers with these financial shortfalls that they're looking at. I do want to leave everybody with um, some of the resources. Um, the full report is available online. Um, we did a blog put together of resources for child care providers, and that was things like navigating the PPP, um, you know, unemployment resources, what child care providers should understand about that. Um, we've, done a, we've done an entire blog series responding to some of the needs of children related to COVID. Um, if you go to this blog of the resources, you'll, you'll get linked back to that full series. Um, we're going to continue talking about these issues, and so I do say if you are facing challenges in your own community, please send us an email or get in touch because we're looking to understand the challenges on the ground. As we shift away from everyone is shut down to slow reopening, understanding the challenges and, and sort of what resource sharing could be most beneficial to all providers. Um, and then the report is also there for rural versus non-rural comparisons. Um, Lisa, have we had any questions come in? No, we just had the one from um, Lorraine, and um, I did send the links out to everybody via chat. Great. So they're there, and the um, we'll have the presentation on our website soon. Wonderful. Yeah, I would welcome folks that, you know, we have about five more minutes left on the, on the time window here because I sort of sped through it to make up for some lost time. Um, if you do have questions about the report, um, you know, do feel free to send them in the chat box. Um, and if you have questions sort of more specifically about what you're experiencing in your community, your center, your organization, feel free to reach out um, by email. I'm not sure if I put my email on the slide, um, but it's just mcarolyn at instituteforchildsuccess.org. Um, we're paying very close attention to this issue. Um, we've also fielded a survey recently with pediatricians in the state, and we'll be sharing some findings from that too. Um, we are working uh, with some community organizations in the low country to understand um, some of the specific needs that organizations, families, and educators are seeing there. Um, no matter how long the acute crisis lasts right now, the actual transmission concerns, the impact of this are going to be felt for a very long time. Um, and so we are committed to providing those resources to help South Carolina child care providers try to rebuild.
There's one chat. Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, everybody. Take care.